pray with me. Father in heaven, God, that is our hope and our prayer this morning, that you would receive all the praise, all the honor, all the glory that's due to you and to you alone. I pray, God, that you'd use the preaching of your word, the power of your word through your spirit. Pray all these things in the strong and powerful name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. All right, you can be seated. Good morning. Welcome again to Family Church. If we haven't had the chance to meet yet, my name is Derek Simpson. I serve as one of the pastors here at our downtown campus. I'm not the usual Bible communicator at our downtown campus. Usually Pastor Jimmy Scroggins is our uh, communicator for the day. Uh, he's our Bible teacher, and, um, but today he's not here. He's preaching at uh, Family Church Jupiter. And, so, and the reason he's at Family Church Jupiter this morning is because he lost a bet. Um, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it was bad. Uh, no, we, from time to time, we, we, uh, he moves around to some of our other neighborhood churches. So I'm excited for uh, Pastor Andrew Hernandez and Pastor Steve Scalisi to be up there this morning for our lead pastor to be there. A couple weeks ago, we were having our uh, Good Friday service here. And uh, I was holding the doors open and greeting people as they came in. I was saying hello to some folks and, uh, as they came to the door. And uh, a little second grade kid runs up and gives me a big hug and tries to tackle me, you know. And, uh, and uh, I said, hey, buddy, good to see you. He, uh, there's, a, there's a young lady on our staff. Her name is Victoria Rodriguez. Some of you know Victoria. She was holding the other door. And the uh, kid looks at Victoria and he points at me and he goes, see this guy right here? That's my second favorite pastor. And then just keeps on walking. <laughs> I don't know who the first is, but I, I assume he was talking about Pastor Jimmy. He's my favorite too, but I'm uh, grateful to be with you today. I love being one of your pastors. I love teaching and preaching God's word. I love all the great things that already happened in the room. So I love, um, you know, John and Jessica and your family, like just the way that you guys have invested over these years in our church and the way that you serve so faithfully. And then, Annie Jane, to see you get up here and get swallowed up by that tub. Like I can barely see your little head sticking out over the, out over the front. But you know, what you did today, Annie Jane, was so encouraging to our entire church. And uh, what, what grade are you in? Third grade. All right, for a third grade girl to get up in front of all these people and to demonstrate your faith in Jesus is such a beautiful and a wonderful thing. And I'm so grateful for what God's done in your life. And you're, you're, you modeling for us today was a really great thing. So I'm really, really proud of you. So thank you for, thank you for being one to do that. And uh, I loved having Tommy and Chelsea there. Yeah, I loved having Tommy and Chelsea up there like cheering you guys on. And you know, at the 930 service, uh, Pastor Zach told you a bit, at the 930 service, uh, pa Tommy and Chelsea were dedicating baby Levi and John and Jessica were standing right there with them. And said, what a beautiful picture of what the church is supposed to be and a, the value of a family and the value of community. I thought it was so great. And then like, I love those baptisms, man. I, I, I love like, at some point, you know, they're baptizing all those people uh, on Easter weekend. And at some point, the people at Lake Park and Village just decided, we're just gonna lay these people down in the sand and let these giant waves just crash over the top of them and just say, all right, you're baptized now. Like, I love that. It was so great. And some of you don't know Pastor Todd uh, Gaston very well. He's our pastor at, at Family Church in North Stewart. But um, I don't know if you saw Pastor Todd. He's a pretty strong guy. He's a pretty, pretty buff guy. But one of those, one of those young men didn't want to go, like, actually get all the way baptized. And Pastor Todd, man, he just put his hand around his face and just flexed on it, just <laughs> all the way into the water. Oh, that was so great. That guy really got baptized, so <laughs> awesome. It was um, wonderful to see so many good, positive examples of the goodness of God's design. And that's what we're doing here this morning is we're uh, continuing in this teaching series called Making a Case for God's Design. Last week, we talked about absolute truth and how absolute truth is kind of truth that it's true for everyone, everywhere, for all times. Whether you affirm it, whether you believe it or not, it's true. It's the kind of true that when you run into it in reality, it doesn't move. It just pushes back on you, whatever that might look like uh, for you. And so for the next several weeks, we're going to look at God's design for our lives and um, we're gonna look at some objections or some obstacles that you have to kind of work through if you're gonna be a believer in Jesus and a believer um, in the truths of the Bible. And uh, here's what I want you to just kind of do. Regardless of um, whether you're brand new to church, whether you're just investigating Christianity, you're not yet a believer, or if you're new to church, 
I, I want you to be challenged. I want you to have an open mind. I want you to think and to consider the things that we're teaching, the things that the Bible is communicating. If, you're, uh, if you've been a believer for a long time, if you uh, consider yourself kind of an experienced Christian, I want you to lean in and engage because I think you're going to hear some things and be exposed to some things. Hopefully that will give you some more confidence to reinforce your, your faith, to continue to, to grow the confidence that you have to keep believing the things that Christians have believed for hundreds and for thousands of years. And there's good reasons for us to um, do that. And so we're gonna answer kind of some big questions together. Last week we looked at like, what is real? Like, how do we know things are real? We looked at absolute truth. Today we're gonna look at where do we come from? How did, how did, how did a creation come to be? And tomorrow and for the next couple weeks, we're gonna look at um, why am I so significant as a person? Like, who am I and what does that mean? And how does it all interact and how does it all connect? And so I hope that you'll hang with us. If you miss a week, I hope you'll go back and catch up on YouTube. But today we're gonna question, uh, we're gonna tackle question number two. So where did we come from? Uh, and we're, of course, going to start our conversation where the Bible starts. We're gonna start in the word of God and we're gonna start at the very beginning of the Bible. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up, turn them on to Genesis chapter one. Genesis is the very first book of the Bible. Chapter one is the first chapter in the first book, and we're going to look at the first verse, Genesis 1, 1. So let's start where the Bible starts. If you have your listening guide, you want to go ahead and take that pen. There should be a pen in the pew back in front of you. If not, find one, borrow one from a neighbor. If you want to write some things down, I encourage you to take notes during our Bible study today. But let's look at the word of God together. Genesis 1, 1. Here's what it says. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Just leave that up there just for a moment. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, if you're tempted, this is a relatively simple sentence. There's not a lot of complexity to it. You might just jump over it. I want to unpack it just for a moment. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is the foundation of our faith. This is the foundation of what we know to be true about reality, about what we know to be true about creation. And there's a lot going on here. There is a beginning, the Bible says, to the world. There is a time uh, when God just existed and then he decided there's going to be the beginning of something. The earth and the heavens haven't always existed. They started somewhere. They began with a, a beginning point. We see in this one verse a rejection of the idea that atheism is a, uh, is a, is a belief system that you can put weight into, that, you can, that, you, that, that will sustain your life and sustain the faith because it says that uh, God existed. God, in the beginning, God. God already existed. God existed before the beginning of the world. Think about that for a moment. There was a time when there was nothing but there was God. God was there. God creates heaven and earth. He creates a distinction between himself and, and the things that he created. He, he, he creates this distinction between uh, the material things of the world that are created and the supernatural things of God. He creates the heaven and earth. We see that God's eternal. God's always been there. He precedes his creation. God's God's eternal. He's always existed. We see that God is a creative God. He's an expressive God. He's an intelligent God. Why? Because he creates. He forms. He's artistic. He creates a world that we can inhabit. He's personal and he's intelligent because he creates a world that is designed for humans and it's made with purpose and meaning and there's beauty and there's splendor and there's design and there's intricacy in it. He's a creative and expressive God. He creates the heavens and the earth. How powerful do you have to be to create all that we can know and all that we can see and all that we can experience and all of the galaxies? God creates that and he does it effortlessly. He just creates it. He's all infinite and all powerful. All of creation, including the physical world, the moral laws of the universe, he creates all of it to allow life to exist and exist in such a way that humans can flourish. We can flourish. If you continue reading in Genesis chapter one, you see that God does all of this just by speaking. He speaks it into existence. He doesn't have to work and to labor at it. He just speaks it. 
And he creates out of nothing the entire world that we see and that we experience. And this is a foundational claim. This is a foundational truth that Christians have to believe. You have to believe this in order to be a Christian. Now, there's a lot of possible objections. There's a lot of uh, obstacles that you have to work through. If you're coming from a, 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 a kind of a non-faith background, if you're investigating Christianity, you've got to work through some different obstacles of faith. You have to work through perhaps the one, one obstacle is other religious accounts of creation. There are other world religions that give options and give uh, narratives about how the world came to be. I encourage you at some point, if you're interested in them, if you've never experienced them, if you've never investigated them, I think you should. I think the more time that you spend investigating the Genesis accounts of other major living world religions, you will grow in your confidence and your assurance that the account of the Bible is a better account, that it's better in thought, it's better it's in simplicity, better it's in simpli- it's, it's simplicity, that's hard to say, it's easy to believe, hard to say. Um, it's better in its completeness, in its rationality. I, I think the beauty of Genesis and the Genesis account is just a better, more remarkable account. And I think it's the most logical and the most cohesive and the most sensible of all the accounts. Some of you may uh, say, hey, maybe you uh, haven't heard or maybe you don't know, Pastor Eric, about this thing called the Big Bang or, or some kind of evolutionary idea or genesis of the world. We'll talk about it a little bit more in a, in, um, later in this talk, but um, one of the things that the Big Bang doesn't do, the, the evolutionary kind of Darwinian approach to the creation of the world is it doesn't answer the question of where matter comes from, which is a pretty big question in that whole equation. And the other thing the Big Bang doesn't do is the Big Bang doesn't, ex- doesn't explain the significance and the meaning of beauty. It doesn't explain why you feel things. C.S. Lewis remarked that um, it becomes difficult if you subscribe to that naturalistic kind of worldview, it becomes difficult to explain why you can, why a man can continue to love a woman, for example. Because you have to constantly think about your mind and the, fact, and, and the reality that your mind is not really loving her. If you're, if you're consistent with that worldview, your mind doesn't really love her. You're really just randomly resonating on a constant basis with randomized expressions of who she is. That's not really who she is. You're just, you're just kind of, just kind of responding. Why, why do you respond to music? Why does music, why does music speak to you in a certain way? Why does music cause a reaction for you? Because if you subscribe to this idea of the, of kind of Darwinian natural big bang theory of how the world came to be, you would, you would have to look at music and say music is just a random, totally created illusion that my nervous system just happens to, on a repeated basis, respond to that makes me feel a certain way. You can't explain why you feel things, why you experience beauty. I've been to some beautiful places. I've had the chance to be, like many of you, I've had a chance to go to the Grand Canyon. It's remarkably beautiful, remarkably beautiful. Why is the experience of the Grand Canyon, why is it so, why is it, why is it so impressive to you? Why, why, why are we moved by rocks and light and water? Because the God of the universe created it. I, I, I had a chance to go, um, my parents were in town this weekend, a couple, uh, when, when I was uh, in college, or just, just, just out, of, out, of, uh, out of college and grad school, um, we had a chance to go to Australia. We spent a, a week in Australia and went to a, a place in Australia called the 12 Apostles. I don't know if you've ever been there. It's an, it's an incredible place, one of the most incredible. We had a chance to be there right at sunset. This was, I didn't take this picture, but it looks very, I mean, this, is, this is what it looks like. But it was better than this, like way better than this. Have you ever experienced that? It's like way better. All right, maybe you could make an excuse or maybe you could, maybe you could come up with some kind of natural way to say why when we experience things, we're moved, but what about things that you haven't experienced and what, what explains why you want to experience things and not just look at a picture of them? For example, I have some friends going to Switzerland soon. Now, I've never been to Switzerland. I really wanna to go to Switzerland. I wanna see the Swiss Alps. Some of you have been there. Some of you have skied there. Don't flex on me. Don't come show me your pictures, okay? Like, I, 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 I'm excited for you. I'm genuinely excited for you, but I, I, I wanna see it for myself. What explains 
how do you explain that that's something that I want to see? Why am I not just satisfied with a picture of it? Because there's something unique about the creation. There's something powerful about it. God created it. I want to experience it. I want to see it. Some of you, um, some of you during this talk, you're just constantly kind of glancing at your phone. And you're, you're glancing at a particular golf tournament that's taking place in the state of Georgia at the moment, right? <laughs> I, I, I've never been to Augusta National. Some of you have. I, I would love to experience Augusta National. I think it's one of the most beautiful. It looks to be one of the most beautiful places. You know what I love about Augusta National? Is that this is, this is what blows my mind about creation is that that's not even how God created that particular piece of ground. What's awesome about our creator is that God gave man the ability to take the things that God created and organize them in such a way that his beauty and his transcendence are on display. I love that, but how do you explain that you wanna experience that and not just be satisfied with a picture of it? Because God created you to know him and to want to experience him for yourself. However you answer the question of how the earth and everything in it came to be, your research will lead you inevitably to a point where you have to experience and you have to flex a little bit of faith. If you believe another major living kind of world religion, you have to believe that that God and that story and that complete worldview is a more believable account of the creation of the universe than the God of the Bible. If you believe in Darwinian, natural evolution, Big Bang, whatever you want to call it, you have to believe, you have to exercise some faith that somehow all of that matter and energy that randomly collided and randomly created the world in which you exhibit and inhibit, that somehow all of that matter and energy just came to be. That takes a lot of faith. I actually think both of those ideas take way more faith than the God of the Bible and the creation account in the Bible. Number two, on your notes, God loves us and created us to know him. God loves us and created us to know him. Creation points you to a God who is knowable and loves you, and you and I are hardwired to connect with God and to know him. The Apostle Paul writes about this and talks about this idea in the book of Romans. In Romans chapter one, starting in verse 18, this is what Paul writes. Paul writes this, he says, for the wrath of God, now hang with me just for a second. He says, the wrath of God, the judgment of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the what? Suppress the truth. They suppress the truth. What did we talk about last week? We talked about the importance of absolute truth. What happens when we reject absolute truth? The apostle Paul says, one of the first things that you are inclined to do when you reject the truth of God, you suppress the truth of God, is that you start to think differently about creation. Look at verse 19. For what can be known about God is plain to them. Because God has shown it to them, showed it to whom? To everyone. Verse 20, for his invisible attributes, the things that you can know about God but not see, but they're invisible, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they, men, are all without excuse. Why? Because we can all walk outside. We can look at the ocean. We look at the stars. We look at the, the moon. We can look at a bird. We can look at our own hand and we can see that God is the maker and the creator of all things, that he's all powerful and all knowing. And so Paul's saying, for all of time, God has made humans and the earth to live in an environment that points us to his existence and desires for us to flourish within a system that he creates. Everyone can clearly perceive there's a creator. You can see his power, you can see the nature of who he is by his creation. Now when I was uh, in college, I needed a job and uh, I needed a job that paid more than just like what a normal you know, college kind of job would pay. Uh, because I wanted to get married. I wanted to start a family. It was getting towards the end of school. And so I, I applied uh, to work for the U.S. federal government. And I became one of the very first employees of a fairly newly created um, branch of the government called the Transportation Security Administration. I was an airport screener. 
That's what I did in college, it was one of my jobs. I had a lot of jobs, that was one of them. It was not the most fun job, it was a very thankless job. And uh, it gave me a lot of time to kind of uh, sit and to, and to like, people watch, right? Because I'm constantly interacting with people at the airport uh, all the time. This is in the days, just, just first year or two after um, 9-11. And so everything was very, very new. Uh, but I, I was one of my jobs. And so I liked it. I had this little game that I like to play. It's not tremendously taxing intellectual work, you know, to like the boarding pass and you check their ID and hand it back to them. Like, you know, it's not, not exactly rocket surgery. And so uh, I had this little game that I would play with myself where I would try to figure out things about people just by what I could observe. And sometimes it was really easy. We live next to uh, several large military installations. So sometimes large groups of soldiers and airmen and uh, sailors would come through and very obvious by their uniform, um, what, who they were and what they did. Uh, sometimes I would have to guess a little bit. And so I would get, you know, you see somebody in a nice suit and you think, oh, maybe a business person, maybe a lawyer, maybe, uh, you know, and sometimes you guess where people are going. And then you would think uh, maybe, you know, they've got uh, 90 degrees outside, but they have a coat. They're probably going someplace cold. And you can begin to patch together some pieces of information about who people were and where they were going. But the reality is, sometimes you're making guesses, sometimes you see, but you just don't know very much with certainty unless they start to give you some very specific information. I can guess somebody's going to a cold weather climate in the middle of June, but if I see in their boarding pass they're going to Antarctica, I know for sure. I can assume somebody might be an attorney, but if I see the luggage tag on their bag that says such and such law firm, then I know for sure. I might assume that a family is traveling together. That's a husband and wife and their kids. But when I ask the man, sir, is this your pink bag? And he says, no, that's my wife's. And he points to her. I know for a fact now they're married. And so we need special information. And that's exactly what the Bible does for us about God and about the idea of creation. His invisible attributes are seen, but then God does something great for us. He gives us special revelation and he shows us the importance of his word in creation. Look with me with Hebrews at Hebrews chapter 11, verse three. Hebrews 11, verse three says, by faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. The word of God created the universe so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Second Peter 3, 5 says it like this. For they deliberately overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. Creation points us to a creator and the creator has revealed himself through his word. His word is how we know that that is true and how we begin to learn more about the creation and the way that it came to be. And when we learn from his word about how creation came to be, we also learn about his moral expectations and his moral laws for the universe. So we should trust his word about creation and how we can flourish in it. It means we pay attention to the moral laws as well. One of the, one of the great proofs, I think, and one of the great encouragements that we should draw from the reality of creation is that if you look at the what the Bible says will happen at the end of time, after Jesus has returned and judged Satan and sin and death for all time and all eternity, the Bible says that the God of the universe recreates creation and human beings to live in a created order again. That should tell you something about how much he values you, how much he cares about you, and how much he cares about the creation he made. Point number three on your notes, God has made his existence obvious. God is invisible, he's otherwise unknowable, but God has chosen to make himself visible and knowable through what he has made. One of the great proofs of God's existence and his active role in creation is clear, both when you zoom in, when you kind of pinch in on the reality that we live in and you zoom in to the microscopic level of creation. When you look, for example, at uh, the complexity of DNA and how DNA uh, works and how DNA transmits information and the, 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 the complexity of all the different ways that that happens inside the human body on the microscopic level, it should give you confidence uh, in the creation abilities of God and the creation narrative of God. There's an argument, you, we don't have time to get into it uh, 
um, it, with great detail here, but you can just write down in your notes, the irreducible complexity argument, the irreducible complexity argument. It's this idea that a single system of complex parts that works together uh, and can't work without all of the parts exist all over creation and all over nature. So you see it, like for example, a great, if, you, if you can't, um, if you just wanna write down the, the mousetrap illustration, right? You can just kind of Google that as well. If you can't, ir- irreducible complexity, that's too complex for you, just m- mousetrap illustration. Cause that's the, that's the basic idea is that uh, there's certain things in nature, there's certain things in our bodies um, that are so irreducibly complex that if one thing was different, one thing was missing, it wouldn't work at all. If you zoom out to the kind of telescopic, not the microscopic level, but the telescopic level and look at the heavens and look at the cosmos and look at the universe, you could, uh, you could Google something called the fine tuning argument, the fine tuning argument. And this is this idea that everything in the heavens that we can observe, everything that we can experience in the earth is specifically calculated and engineered to produce exactly what has happened in the universe. And it's just highly, highly, highly unlikely that that is a result of random chance. There's actually a guy in our church, his name's Greg Rumo. He was in the 930 service. He's a leader in our church. He's a professor of chemistry at Palm Beach Atlantic University. And he's written several articles that are really, really helpful. And they're written, um, I think, at a very accessible level. And so uh, you might wanna consider Googling his name and reading some of the things that he's written. But what can't be known just by looking at the universe is Jesus. You can know a lot about God. You can see a lot of things about God's creation, but creation tells you that there is a God. It tells you that that God is powerful, but your conscience is what tells you that you violated the moral laws of the universe. And I'm so grateful that point number four on our notes is true. Jesus has made God accessible. Jesus has made God accessible. God is the creator and we are his creation. Now, in future weeks, not next week, but over the course of the next several weeks, we're going to deal with the problem of evil and why evil exists later in the series. But we feel the effects of brokenness and we feel the effects and the result of sin all around us. And we talk about this a lot here at Family Church, but um, we, we're talking about the goodness of God's design. We experience brokenness in a very profound and real way. And the Bible says that our brokenness is a result of sin and that God loves you so much that God chose not to allow you to stay and to remain in your brokenness, but God acted on your behalf and on my behalf and sent Jesus to die on the cross for your sin. And he sent Jesus to feel the full guilt and the full shame and the full wrath of God, the separation of God that we, we feel in part, Jesus felt it in whole because he was dead and buried and crucified, the Bible says, for three whole days. But then to demonstrate his love and his power over sin and over darkness and over guilt and shame, the Bible says that God raised him from the dead. And anybody that, reco- that, that would receive Jesus by faith, that would repent and believe of their sins, can recover and pursue God's design for our lives. And that's the good news of the gospel, but it's the good news of the gospel that God created us in such a way that we can have a relationship with him through his son, Jesus. And if you think about that event, you think about that activity, you think about and you see the rebellion of man on full display because what happened in the crucifixion of Jesus was Men and women took the materials that God put on this earth for our good and for our flourishing. They took the iron ore out of the ground and they melted it into hammers and into nails. And they took the trees that God planted in the earth and grew up strong for our protection and they cut them down and they made handles and crosses out of them. And then the God of the universe willingly subjected himself to having nails driven through his wrists and driven through his feet and hung on a cross. Why? To demonstrate his great love for you. All of creation, the God, the Bible says, all of creation declares his handiwork and his goodness and it's all for you. And so when you see a sunrise, 
when you hold a baby in your arms, when you experience the warmth of of the sun, it's God screaming to you, not just about the goodness of those things, although they are good. It's God screaming to you to believe and to trust in Jesus. To believe and to trust in Jesus. There's no greater proof and there's no greater reminder of the gospel of Jesus than the Lord's Supper. And for thousands of years, for centuries, Christians have taken the Lord's Supper to proclaim and to re, uh, retell the story of God's great love for us. And, and proclaiming our belief in the resurrection that one day God's going to return to set all things right and bring men and women to himself. And so what we're about to do is take the Lord's Supper here at Family Church. And the way we talk about it and do it at Family Church is just like this. If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, we wanna invite you to take the Lord's Supper with us. If you're a member of Family Church or if you've been baptized, believers baptized baptism by immersion, even if you're not a member of Family Church, we invite you to take the Lord's Supper with us. If you're uh, visiting with us today and you would normally take the Lord's Supper at the church that you attend, you're welcome to take it as our guest. But if you're not a believer in Jesus, if you've not been baptized, believers baptism by immersion, I encourage you um, not to partake of the Lord's Supper, but just to simply wait to reflect, consider giving your life to Jesus and receiving Jesus by faith. And then you can take the Lord's Supper with integrity after you've walked through uh, the steps of baptism with us here at Family Church. But for right now, what I want you to do is just to sit quietly, to reflect and to think, uh, perhaps confess sin, uh, pray if you need to. And then uh, after a time of singing, we'll take and eat.